Good afternoon and welcome to all of you from all over the country. My name is Susan Talbot and I'm a member of the Baltimore, Maryland City League of Women Voters. Before we begin this afternoon, I want to take a minute to recognize Camille Wheeler. She died suddenly yesterday of pancreatic cancer. And we remember her as an instrumental leader in Baltimore County, as president of the League of Women Voters, an incredible social worker who had a professional life over many, many years. She was instrumental in starting this events committee that all of us are so proud to be working on. And we want to remember her as a friend and colleague and to let you know how important she was, even though most of you don't know her but she was a terrific person on our committee and we only started our job last August. So Camille was a real uh, part of our getting going with our, with our uh, events committee. I also want to recognize our sponsors, the League of Women Voters of Baltimore City and County and the Pratt Library. And I wanted to be sure you know that this program is being recorded and we're asking each of you to please keep yourselves muted so as to prevent any noise from your individual homes or offices from interrupting the program. If you have questions or a comment, please put them in the chat. And later on, there will be a question and answer period moderated by Mara Braberman. And before we begin, I do wanna tell you a little bit about the League for those of you who may not know. The League is a nonpartisan political organization open to all. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. The League's members work on issues critical to our democracy, such as limiting the impact of money in politics and fighting voter suppression. League members provide testimony to legislative committees at all levels of government. They monitor government meetings and track important bills. The League also registers voters, including new citizens, and it educates voters about candidates for office, as well as critical issues facing the electorate. The Vote 411 ORG site is updated before every local election to provide information about candidates and issues that will be on the ballot. Guidance on how to register and locate polling places is also provided. Additionally, the League sponsors events and webinars and distributes a variety of educational publications. Half a million League members work nationwide to advocate for social and economic justice for all. And we invite you to join us. And in the chat today is a uh, link to find a local League. And we hope those of you who are not members will decide that you would like to join us. This afternoon, our topic will be the crisis in local journalism. And over the past 15 years, more than one in five US newspapers has closed, leaving hundreds of communities with no local news outlet. In other communities, papers have been purchased by national firms without strong ties to their communities, thus eroding local coverage there. What happens to a community without a local newspaper? What efforts are being made to save local papers or provide alternatives? And what can we as consumers of local news do to help save our newspapers? We are very fortunate today to have Liz Bowie as our guest to tell us about the crisis from her perspective as a reporter for the Baltimore Sun for over 20 years. Liz is a Baltimore native, and I'm proud to say a graduate of Skidmore College as I am. And during her career at the Sun, she has covered every aspect of education. And many of you will remember her award-winning series on homeless youth. She has also reported on the environment, business, and state government news. Liz is a highly respected journalist as evidenced by her having been awarded the Spencer Fellowship in Education reporting by Columbia University. This is a very prestigious and highly competitive award. So I'm proud to welcome Liz Bowie as the honored guest of the Baltimore City and County League of Women Voters Event Committee. Thank you, Liz, for making time to speak to us about the crisis in local journalism. Hello, and good morning to everyone. Um, I hope I can fill you in on some of the national, give you some national perspective, 
but also talk a little bit about what's happening here in Baltimore because it's pretty exciting, I think. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that um, there's, I wanted to talk about um, some of the things that have been going on. When Mara contacted me several months ago um, to ask if I would speak to you all today, I was much less hopeful than I am right now. And so much has happened in the last two months even, and even in the last 12 hours, I've had to update this presentation. So let's get started with um, the backstory of all the bleak facts about um, local news. Can you start the slide? So what's happened in, maybe if we could go to the second slide. So since, um, since, hold on just a minute. Since 2004, we've lost a quarter of our newspapers, including 70 dailies. Um, and we've lost, um, we now have 200 counties in the United States that have no newspaper. And that's really important because they have no other credible source of information. Um, there are now two thirds of counties in the US that don't have a daily newspaper. The other problem is that a lot of the newspapers that have survived are really what we call in the industry ghost newspapers. In other words, their staffs has been so diminished so far that they really can't cover their communities. They can't go to all the city council meetings. They can't go to school board meetings. They can't write investigative stories. They can't cover the arts community adequately. And, and maybe a lot of those papers are filled with wire stories. That is really important because we believe that newspapers are really a way for the community to have a conversation with itself. And without that means, without the newspaper being a, the, a means to do that, you really lose that sense of community within your city or your county or your small town. Um, in um, between, you can see that the statistics on um, between 2008 and 2010 and 2018, the number of reporters and editors has dropped by half to 35,000. In the Sun newsroom alone, we've gone from about, well, over 450 journalists in a newsroom in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, we had um, numerous foreign bureaus, a, a large Washington bureau, um, somebody in San Francisco, somebody in New York. Um, we had very large suburban bureaus. We're now down to less than 100 journalists. I think it may even be somewhere around 80 or 90 in our newsroom. We don't have the bureaus. We don't have any foreign correspondents. No, we don't even really have a, a, a full person in DC. So can we have the next slide? So why did this happen? Why have we lost so much? Um, and clearly the biggest driver of this is the fact that there, our print advertising has been basically replaced by online advertising re revenue. And we just, it's, we can't sell, we don't have the revenue to support such large newsroom. The other, the newsrooms, the other problem is that Google and Facebook have basically sucked up all of the advertising and pushed down the price for um, running an ad online. We also know that there's been a shift, obviously, in the number of people who read their papers um, in the print edition and the people who get their source of news online from multiple sources. Um, newspapers also didn't really adapt quickly enough to the digital age. And um, we also didn't quickly enough put up paywalls. So people got used to getting all of the content for free. And why would you want to subscribe to a newspaper if it's free? Um, 
too late, I think we did put up those paywalls and now we're trying to build subscribers um, very slowly on our online, for our online um, product. Could I have the next slide, please? I'm gonna start talking a little bit. Um, uh, oh, I wanted to add that one of the things that um, has been really hard, I think, about the loss of local news throughout the country is that you've seen people turn to social media. And I think you can draw a direct link between all of the loss of newspaper reporters and newspapers who provide a comprehensive look at what's happening in their communities and nationally to this sort of rapid spread of misinformation in this country and really to the January 6th event, which culminated, I, I guess, all of that. Um, there are reasons to be hopeful, I believe, and I wanted to sort of go through, uh, we, can get, we can go through this last slide and then I'll come back on and you don't have to look at a screen. Um, but um, I am really hopeful that we can, um, we can turn the tide. And I wanted you to just look, go over, I'm gonna tell you sort of the tale of the Baltimore Sun in the last year, but I wanted you to just understand who the players are in that tale. There's Tribune Publishing Company. It owns eight major newspapers or a lot of major, a lot of newspapers, including a number of major newspapers in the US. You'll see their names there. There's also Golden Global Capital, which now owns a third of the stock in Tribune. And it's a vulture head fund that is out to destroy newspapers. And when I, when you think I may be exaggerating that, um, just go, Google Alden Glo Global Capital at some point and you'll see what comes up. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and the third important character in this, in this saga is Stuart Bainham, who is, um, has, owns a group of hotels and he now wants to buy the sun. So if we could go back to, if we could get rid of the slideshow. Thank you. Um, so what happened? So for number a number of years, really more than a decade, there have been um, foundations in Maryland, particularly the Able Foundation, that has been interested that have been interested in trying to get the paper back um, under local hand, into local hands. And that, that discussion has been going on for years and there have been multiple attempts, they never succeeded. I um, became really, really disillusioned in 2018 when I saw the paper losing a lot of its reporters and editors. And I went to, that's really when I, think of as the beginning of this, I went to um, Bob Embry um, in April of 2018 um, and asked him to please start working again on a project to get the sun bought. And, you know, we had a great discussion. We had a, um, I had a turkey salad sandwich in his office um, and we had a great discussion. Um, then a year went by, a year, more than a year, went by um, in November, 2019, um, really panic set in, in our newsroom because that was when the, um, there was an announcement that Alden had purchased about a third of the stock in Tribune Publishing Company. And it was going to try to gain control of the board of directors. And I read and read about it and I was really, really upset and thought, well, it's, it's either time to leave the paper or I've got to try to do something before I leave. I've been there more than 30 years. My mother was a reporter and editor at The Sun. Um, my husband worked at The Sun um, and I really am dedicated to that institution. Um, it certainly consumed a lot of my life. So I felt I really wanted to just pour my heart into trying to do whatever I could do to save it. So I went back to the, and a number of other people in our newsroom felt the same way. And so I went back in the winter of 2020 
to um, Bob Embry and Matt um, Gallagher at the Goldsecker Foundation and Ted Benatoulis, who is, have all been involved in, in that um, effort before. And we began meeting um, in a downtown hotel um, early, in early mornings, um, having breakfast and with them and um, the union that represents um, the workers at the Baltimore Sun, the News Guild. And I brought in um, a couple of News Guild leaders at the Sun. Um, we also worked with KO Public Relations, which did and has done an amazing job. Um, the, the News Guild, we decided that we would launch a public campaign to try to, called Save Our Sun, to try to educate the community about what the problem was and that there really needed to be local ownership to sort of build a, a community um, drive to, to get the paper back. Um, and so uh, the News Guild actually uh, hired KO Public Relations to help with this and they launched the petition drive. We have a website. Um, if you don't know about it, it's Save Our Sun. Um, we got in May of, um, of 2020, we got 6,000 people to sign their names to the petition and we gave that petition to the Tribune um, publishing company the day before the board of directors were to meet. Um, we didn't expect it to have much effect, but it was this clear message from 6,000 people in Baltimore and Maryland, um, let our newspaper go. So that was fairly um, successful, we thought. Um, and subsequently, um, it's, this has actually become public in the last it became public last night, but in an SEC filing, but we now know that um, the ABLE Foundation, probably the ABLE Foundation, um, uh, offered to, to buy the paper for $25 million um, in, in May of uh, 2020. Obviously their offer was turned down. It wasn't nearly as much money as Tribune, the Tribune leadership wanted. Um, so we continued our efforts through the summer. Matt Gallagher worked hard on raising money, um, local money, um, and there was another attempt um, that also failed. Um, but there was something that did that did survive, uh, that did continue, and that was um, the Save Our Sun effort. Then expanded to all of the other markets in Tribune newspapers. The, there are um, unions at each of the, almost all of the um, Tribune newspapers now. And so all of us joined together and we started as, as Save Our um, Save our Sun, Save Our Hartford Current, Save Our uh, uh, um, Chicago Tribune. Um, but they, these units all work together. And we came out with a statement that said that we no longer had faith um, and confidence in the ownership of the newspaper, and we wanted to um, find local investors. So since this summer, um, reporters in each of the cities um, where there are Tribune newspapers have been looking for local investors in their community. I also, at that point, began sort of talking to people nationally about what could be done to put pressure on Alden to um, let go of the sun. Um, and I also, and, and other local newspapers, and I kind of tapped into this local news movement. Um, there are a number of, of real key figures around the country now who have been begun to recognize that we really can't let these newspapers go, these legacy newspapers, um, that despite um, the growth of digital uh, startups that has been um, tremendous in the last 10 years. Um, those digital startups aren't providing the same kind of comprehensive co coverage that a legacy newspaper does. They don't have um, 100 people in their newsroom. They might have 20. Um, they're great at covering small segments of the news, but they're not, they're not providing comprehensive coverage. They also just don't have, generally speaking, um, the heft, the in, uh, investigative heft of uh, a newspaper. 
So we those those um, sort of thinkers around the nation are really launching some national efforts to try to um, <clears throat> help get this going. There, there's lots of um, efforts which I can talk about a little later, but um, I just want to continue this for a couple more minutes to tell you the saga. So in October, um, really unknown to some of us in the Save Our Sun campaign, Stuart Bainham um, secretly started to looking to look at the purchase of the Sun um, company. Um, and he started working with uh, Ted Venetoulis, um, who was in the Save Our Sun group. Um, and then in January, uh, it, there was an SEC filing. It became clear that Bainham had made an agreement with, um, had, had, had Basically, Bainham had gotten Alden to the table by threatening to buy the whole of Tribune Company. And Alden was clearly out to get control of all of Tribune. And so they were frightened by this idea that Bainham, who's a billionaire, might actually go after the whole company. So they, they, they did a deal with Bainham and said he could buy the Sun for $65 million dollars. Um, as and but that it was contingent on Alden buying all of Tribune. In Mar in March, just a couple weeks ago, that deal sort of fell apart. Um, there was, which was really shocking to a lot of us because the negotiations had appeared to be going well. Um, but what happened was the um, there were there are service agreements um, and. Bainham, want, I mean, uh, Alden wanted to, to charge an outrageous sum of money to provide back-end support um, for the Baltimore Sun after its purchase. There are all kinds of things that um, were very interconnected. Um, our newspapers are so interconnected. So for instance, the platform that I write on and, I, and the, the online paper is published on is, is all connected to the other papers. So if if uh, Stuart Bainham were to buy the paper tomorrow, he actually couldn't put out a paper without the support of Tribune. So he had to come to a deal over what he was gonna um, be charged for a couple of years while he set up the back end of the Baltimore Sun. And Bainham and uh, Alden wanted to charge him $12 million a year and keep him in that uh, back end system for five years. So they were basically more than doubling the price of the, of the purchase, which was insane. Um, so what's happened now? So Bainham, in a, in basically through leaks to the media, um, said he wanted to go after all of Tribune. And in fact, last night, there was a crucial SEC filing that came out that said that he had made um, an offer to buy all of the Tribune papers for um, a price that's about a dollar and twenty-five cents above what Alden has has um, offered. Uh, despite that, the board at Tribune has said that they prefer an Alden purchase. So we don't know what the end of the story is going to be. We are hopeful that uh, Mr. Bainham gets, um, if he doesn't, isn't successful in getting the entire publication, uh, entire company, he at least continues to negotiate and gets the sun. Why this is really important, I know a lot of, and many people on this call may not be from Baltimore or um, Maryland. So, but it, this, this microcosm of, of or this story of what's going on here in Baltimore and in the other cities with the Tribune company is really very interesting because it is, it, if Bainham is successful, it would be the first time that anybody knows of that, I mean, I'm, I've actually confirmed this, but it's the first time that a newspaper chain would be taken apart. So Stuart Bainham wants to if he were to get all of the companies, he wants to sell off individual papers to local owners. And 
he wants to turn the Baltimore Sun into a nonprofit. Um, that means that all of the revenues that we produce would be plowed back into the journalism, um, which would give us a lot more reporting and editing heft than we have now. Um, and I think that local, if Bainham is successful, what you would see is eight experiments in local journalism um, or local ownership um, sort of try, being tried out throughout the country. We know that everyone knows now that the, the New York Times and the Washington Post have been very successful in um, gathering new readers, their paper, their newsrooms are fat and happy. Um, they have plenty of subscribers. Uh, I think the New York Times has 7 million subscribers right now. And most of their revenue that supports that journalism comes from digital subscribers. Um, but, but a local newspaper like the Baltimore Sun really can't depend on that kind of, we're not, gonna, we're not going to attract you know, 3 million subscribers to um, our website. So we have to find smaller newspapers, regional newspapers like the Sun or the Hartford Current or the Chicago Tribune are going to need to find a sort of new model in how to successfully um, run this business. So I think that that it's a really exciting time um, for local news because we may be on the verge of, of this sort of broad experiment. Um, I think there are lots of ways in which this can work. I think we could, um, there's, there's momentum now um, around trying to get Google and Facebook, which have sucked off all this advertising to either let go of some of their revenue um, or or share it. Um, there's some, some complicated um, efforts going on in Australia right now. Um, I think that we're going to have to, to really grow our online subscriptions um, and charge more. I think we're gonna have to um, maybe figure out, there's, there's a suggestion that um, there might be a tax that goes into supporting local newspapers just as, or some kind of public journalism um, fund, um, just the way we have a public um, broadcasting um, network. Um, <clears throat> but, and I could go into more of that, but it, it, there are a lot of different options now that, that are being looked at for how to run a local newspaper and also how to run a nonprofit newspaper. What can you do to help us? Um, please subscribe, <laughs> please subscribe um, and be a really voracious reader of local news. Um, research shows that your tax dollars will go up if there's not a strong newspaper in your community um, and also that voting turnout will go down when you don't have a newspaper. Um, if the sun is turned into a nonprofit, it will belong to the community. So be part of that community that cares and discusses the support for reliable sources of news in your community. Um, we hope that um, if the sun is on its own, we will try to have, a, have much better coverage. Um, we hope that that the community will be part of a conversation about what they want to see in their newspaper, that the community will think about that paper as theirs and, and take it on. Um, we also ask, we're holding a rally, um, probably on April 3rd, I'm pretty sure it's on April 3rd, in outside of City Hall. And we're inviting all of the community to come to show their support for Stuart Bainham's bid to get the Sun and Tribune. So please show up at the rally. Um, I'll, I'll definitely send out information um, to make sure of that date, but we think it's April 3rd at one o'clock outside City Hall. Thank you. Thanks, Liz, that's great. Um, we have quite a few questions. <laughs> so you, you answered a couple of them, but actually most of them we haven't even touched on yet. 
Um, so one question is, if there's an acquisition by a white knight, um, as there was when the nonprofit Lenfest Institute for Journalism took over the Philadelphia Inquirer, saved that paper, um, is this really a viable solution for most newspapers across the US that someone, a wealthy person or a nonprofit a foundation or whatever comes forward? Is that really something that is gonna save enough papers? We really believe it is a good alternative. Um, it's being tried in, in several cities, Salt Lake, um, Philadelphia, are two examples. They have different mo nonprofit models, and there's actually a whole debate over which nonprofit model is the best nonprofit model. Um, I know Stuart Bainham has been looking at a lot of different nonprofit models. One of them is a sort of nonprofit with a little bit of profit so that you can, um, I mean, basically, you're still a business that's, that's operating as a business. Um, to bring in revenue, but you are doing it under a nonprofit status. Um, but I think Lenfest is a bit of a profit model, so they um, avoid having to get rid of their editorial board, um, so they can still um, do opinion, you know, write opinion, endorse candidates, that kind of thing. So one idea um, that an attendee alerted me to was that um, in some areas, their co-ops of community members are gathering. This was detailed in a really interesting Washington, Washington Monthly article in late 2020. Um, and again, I just wonder if this is a realistic model for keeping local newspapers alive, that communities come together and people put in small amounts of money. I mean, I think, you know, we've seen that work with public radio, and I'm, I'm sure that we would be, um, as a nonprofit, we would be asking for donations from um, <clears throat> people, you know, community groups um, uh, regularly every year. We'd look for grants, we'd look for, um, we'd probably hold uh, programs that would bring events that would bring in money we do all kinds of things to um, support the journalism. Um, I think the big difference is right now, um, Alden Global Capital, even in the first year it's owned these newspapers has um, closed down almost all of the newspaper offices except for the Sun and the Chicago Tribune. Um, they have sucked our profits out of us and um, even to the point that there's now uh, $200 million sitting in the bank at Tribune um, and fewer and fewer journalists. So this isn't a situation where um, we aren't profitable or um, we're about to slide under. It's, it's more a case of that money needs to go back into the, the paper. So you mentioned the us what's going on in Australia. And that was one thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, Australia is considering taxing social media companies for their aggregation of news that others have produced. And Facebook and Google separately negotiated with some Australian media conglomerates, not all, to pay for news. And they have ongoing negotiations with others. But it raises the question of whether it's dangerous for the government to be, I mean, it's one thing if there's a contract negotiation between essentially two private entities, but there's been a question raised of whether a government like Australia or here in the United States really should be funding newspapers. Is that gonna make possibly taint or present a conflict of interest for journalism? might be a steady source of, res of revenue, but does it could cause a whole different problem? Um, it, it could. I mean, I think <clears throat> certainly, you know, those questions have always been raised. And I guess they're always raised with public broadcasting um, channels. Um, but 
um, you know, one thing that's problematic is there's, and I, I don't pretend to be an expert on this, so I may butcher what I'm trying to explain, but um, one of the problems is that anti antitrust regulations are preventing newspapers collectively getting together to bargain with Google and Facebook over letting go of, of uh, you know, basically providing a, a united front saying, you know, you're really destroying our news organizations and you need to, to, to come to grips with that and negotiate with us. And because of antitrust issues, they ha we haven't been able to do that. So one thing that could happen would be, um, you know, Congress could pass a law saying that's allowed, or we get, you know, we get permission to do it. And I, I, I'm not clear on how that happens, honestly, but I, I know that is one issue. Um, we've also had a couple of questions about with the um, crisis that's affecting local journalism, how has it also affected um, black owned newspapers? and other publications that are owned by people of color, are they also having running into the same problems or are they faring better? No, it's, it's affecting everybody and um, black owned publications as well. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not, the problem is everywhere. Okay, so, so all the chains, because we had someone else ask about the status of the Gannett newspapers. Are those also in trouble? Yeah, well, I mean, the fact is that about half of newspapers in the country right now are owned by hedge funds. So um, Gannett is largely, I mean, these hedge funds have big ownership stakes in the large chains. Um, and Gannett has debt right now. Um, and basically there's been this huge consolidation of newspapers into only a very few owners. Um, and every time they're consolidated, they seem to shrink the news, the, the, um, they take on debt and then they shrink the, the journalism. Um, so somebody asked about attracting younger readers who we know often don't have the habit that many of us grew up in with of there being a daily newspaper delivered to the house and seeing our parents and other older people read regularly and kind of continuing in that tradition. So how could the Sun and similar newspapers begin to attract younger readers? Um, one idea that somebody else brought up is, does it make sense to start a podcast, for instance, to not expect them to read, but to listen instead? Um, I think the Sun Newsroom is eager to try all of these experiments. Um, if we get purchased by um, Stuart Bainham and, and we're, by the way, the, the, the nonprofit that uh, Bainham has set up to run the sun is called Sunlight for All Institute, um, which is a wonderful name. And um, I think Sunlight for All would give us the capacity to try all new th these new things. We would love to try more on TikTok, which is a very young oriented audience. Um, we'd love to do podcasts. We'd love to, I mean, the New York Times is doing television now. Um, I don't know that that makes sense, but um, certainly podcasts. We've tried podcasts, but it's just very hard to do if you have a very limited budget for it. So um, it's been, you know, one interview, one, one uh, reporter interviewing another reporter um, in between writing the stories. And that's probably not the best way to get a great podcast going. So um, <laughs> eager to try things that new readers, young readers would love. Um, so can you also talk about report for the Report for America program? I noticed that the Sun is participating. Could you explain what that is? And I know that the Sun has been participating in it. Report for America is wonderful. Um, it's it it is one of those efforts, um, uh, national efforts, um, to try to help local newspapers um, become more sustainable. Um, it started by a guy named Steve Waldman, who I just think of as like one of the great thinkers in the nation right now on how to save local news. 
um, he, he started it some years back um, and he's great at raising money. And it's basically modeled off Teach for America, which most people are familiar with. Um, he raises money, um, sort of half the salary of a local reporter, um, and then hires, um, trains, hi well, hires uh, young reporters, um, usually with very little experience, uh, to go into, originally it was to go into underserved communities. So these, these would be places like the middle of Montana with, you know, a newspaper with four people in it. And this this person would be an extra body, um, would get training, but also would help uh, um, beef up those very small news organizations. Um, because uh, newspapers like The Sun have, have had their newspaper sh uh, staff shrink so drastically in the last few years, we, um, he turned to, to supplying reporters for our publications as well. So. We have two um, Report for America uh, reporters in our newsroom. Um, one is covering the Black community, and the other is covering the Latino community, um, focusing particularly on stories that we would not normally um, get to. So you've probably seen some of these great profiles of different people um, who are, or different uh, church, I think there was one wonderful story about a Latino church in uh, Fells Point um, recently. Um, so it's, it's, it's great stuff. Um, the other thing Steve's trying to do is he's, he's written something called a white paper um, for how to replant newspapers from the toxic soil of hedge funds into the local nurturing soil of local owners. Um, and he wants to raise a billion dollars to help do this in the next several years. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it kind of, what it's sounding like to me is like there's, we're going to end up with many different solutions. So some papers may be bought by, let's say by a foundation or a nonprofit. Other papers may be supported by their communities. Some may get help from this, this effort you were just talking about. So it may really change how newspapers are. Oh. Yeah, I think that there's a really wonderful effort that and I forgot to sort of mention this, that um, working with the other Tribune unions um, has been a really incredible experience for me. Um, these reporters in every one of those cities, as I mentioned, has gone out and tried to find local owners and build a community base to support local, to support their newspaper. And we now have, um, believe it or not, in six months, we've, we've gotten local owners, local investors who are in Hartford and Allentown and now um, Orlando to step up and say they would buy their newspaper from um, Bainham or Alden or somebody, whoever's going to own it, um, whether they can, you know, and I think that what is so remarkable is that um, Stuart Bainham would not try to gouge the, the communities. He would sell the newspapers at a reasonable price. Um, and that, that would allow all these sort of different experiments to happen. But it's really been through the, I think, through the really hard work of reporters in each of those communities um, trying to figure out how they're going to save their newspapers. And it's kind of a remarkable thing because reporters hate to be on the front lines. We hate to be people who are advocates for anything. Um, we like standing in the background. But I think enough of us have just decided, like, we can't do this or we don't have the, we lose those institutions. And so we've, we've gone out and do, done really uncomfortable work for us. Well, we're glad you're doing it. <laughs> um, so one person wrote to say that she had trained as a journalist many years ago and in journalism school, she was taught to be objective and not express an opinion in news reporting. And today she finds, and she's talking here, not just about the sun. She made it clear she reads a number of newspapers. She finds news articles in different newspapers have a point of view. 
And is this the way that American print journalists is going? And what does it mean for the readers? Are they gaining something? Or are they losing something by this change in focus? Yeah, I mean, I think probably, I, I think I'm not sure that we would say that we write stories with a point of view. Um, I think that because our society is so fractured um, and so polarized that many people believe will read a, a story um, and see opinion in it um, because it doesn't, it somehow is not supporting of their opinion. Um, so I'm not sure I completely agree with the question. I do think that that you know, there is a much bolder move by um, newspapers to call out lying when it's, when there's, to call out untruths and some people, that offends some people. Um, so another question we received actually related to the League of Women Voters, because we are always putting out information about, um, you know, upcoming elections and how to register, et cetera, and about various local community matters, statewide matters. And the question that came up is given how journalists are more, there are fewer journalists now and they cannot be everywhere covering, particularly at the local level. Um, are there ways in which the league should be stepping up? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know, I mean, I think you know, I, I think Stuart Bainham wants to really beef up local coverage. Like he would put a lot more money into reporter, you know, putting more reporters in Baltimore County and Baltimore City. And um, I don't, I don't know what the role is for community organizations or advocacy organizations um, in all of this. I do think that some of the, you know, the Baltimore Brew, for instance, has been very good. Um, you know, it's helped, it's helped do a lot of good journalism. Um, and I think other digital startups are, are doing a good job. I just don't think they can, they can't cover the waterfront the way we do, um, even though we're really thin. Um, but I think, I think, you know, there, there is a role for communities. I don't think we've figured that out yet. Okay. Um, another person wrote in ahead to com compliment the Sun for outstanding investigative reporting, uh, for example, on the scandal with Mayor Pugh and the Gun Trace Task Force. Um, he wrote, these Maryland stories require skill, support, and courage to pursue and publish. What big investigative stories is the Sun working on now, if you're allowed to tell us <laughs> that I added that. Um, but also somebody else asked, does investigative journalism sell more papers and increase subscriptions? You know, it's a little unclear. Are people really buying for the big stories or are they buying for the constant news about, you know, the- I, I think we have to do both. Day? Yeah, I think we have to do both. I think we have to provide people with um, breaking news as quickly as possible, as thoroughly as possible. And we also have to do good investigative work. Um, unfortunately, right now we don't have an investigative team. That's one of the things we've lost in the last year. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have people working on investigative stories, but we don't have the sort of hit, I mean, what. What has happened, for instance, what happened in the Pew investigation was that um, a beat reporter, uh, Luke Broadwater, um, found that story, broke it, and then um, all of the investigative reporters in the newsroom piled on, um, as well as a bunch of other of us. And um, it really was a very exciting story and we all worked as a newsroom. One of the great things about, I think about our Sun newsroom is we're all, um, we all get along. We're all very, um, we love what we do um, and we love working together. So um, that story was happened because of great 
collegial work. Um, and not only by our investigative team, but also a lot of beat reporters. So we have time for two more questions. Um, we have a couple of people tuned in from the Chicago area who wanted to know if there's someone locally in that area, so at the Tribune, who they could talk to because they want to get more specifically about what's happening there with their local paper. So um, I should pass on some contact information. Um, please go out and try and find somebody to buy the Chicago Tribune because right now we don't have anyone who wants to buy the Chicago Tribune um, and we'd love to find one, somebody. Um, the Guild there is just starting efforts. Um, we have done some digging around the, the News Guild um, leadership nationally and some other people who I can't really talk about, but we've been digging around in trying to find somebody in Chicago land who would um, would step up and we haven't so far. So our final question is um, a couple people raised um, questions about subscriptions. One person that it's very expensive to have a print subscription um, and another person wondering if a digital subscription to a newspaper really supports the paper to the same extent or whether you really should by a print subscription. And then of course the digital gets tacked on. Right, I mean, obviously we bring in more revenue with the print, but we, but if all you can do is the digital, do the digital. I mean, we need to probably double our digital subscriptions um, in the next few years. But if we have enough digital subscribers that will support our news, sustain the current size of our newsroom, believe it or not. So um, those digital subscriptions are really important to us. And I think you can bet on the cost of those going up a little bit. Um, actually, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, so we have a question. What would you say to someone who's hoping to study journalism in college or is studying journalism in college now? Is this something that has much of a future? I hope so. <laughs> Or I, yes, I think of course it does. Um, we haven't seen um, a drop in the number of people who want to read news stories. Um, actually, it's exploded in the last four years. So, you know, it, the fact that together the Post and the Times have 10 million readers is just unbelievable. I mean, we've never, those papers together have never had 10 million readers in their entire existence, I don't think. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a lack of readers. I just think we need to work on how to figure out the business model um, to make this survive. And um, that's going to take some trial and error. I think there are going to be some newspapers, local newspapers who die, and maybe that's going to have to happen. Um, and other ones that try things and are wildly successful. Um, you know, I think I think there's just going to be a lot of shakeout in the industry um, in the next five to 10 years. Well, thank you very much. This is very enlightening. And um, obviously, we're going to have to follow the story of what happens with the Sun and the other Tribune papers. Um, as I've mentioned to you, I'm the Hartford Current is very close to my heart because it was my local newspaper for 30 years. It's also the oldest continuously published newspaper in the United States. So if that one goes down, we've really lost a lot. Um, so we're all sort of hoping and um, thank you very much. Yeah, please keep, uh, keep looking at what's going on and cheer for us um, when we need it. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, um, Thank you very much, Liz Bowie. Uh, my name is Gail Sunderman. I'm part of the events committee. And I just want to wrap this up. Um, you know, I think we're all aware that there was problems. And I think what you've given us is a much more in-depth look at, at, at what that problem is, but also um, these efforts to do something about it. Um, you know, I wasn't aware of that except through, you know, an occasional story that was written about the, um, the current sun issue. So thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, 
So I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I put again, we urge you to find a local league. I put a link again in the chat for um, uh, to find a local league in Maryland. Um, our next event will be on April 15th. Um, it's not tax day anymore, so we can all um, come to this event. And we will be hosting Tom Pelton. I'm sure many of you in Maryland are familiar with him. Uh, he's an environmental journalist and he will be talking about jumpstarting the Chesapeake Bay. We will follow up with information to everyone who's uh, registered and participated in our events. So again, thank you, Liz. This has been very informative and thank you everyone um, who has, who uh, joined us today. And we hope to see you uh, next month. Thank you very much.